Here's a preview of this episode. Episode with Brent Gill. It's our third to last episode in season one. Of- uh, support of the venue type of control. Very proud of that. Wow, and, really? Uh, huh. Yeah, 10,000 people. Your show, your space, your venue, your environment, your And now, this episode. Hi, everybody. Mark Masters here. Really excited to introduce this episode with Brent Gill. It's our third to last episode in season one of Mark Masters. The last three episodes are all Comedy Works headliners. Brent Gill lives in Los Angeles, but a deep history in Colorado. Uh, He headlines Comedy Works, runs the Boulder Comedy Show. You're going to learn all kinds of things about comedy show running. Uh, it's, it's so good. I just listened to the whole episode for the first time in a couple months and I actually pulled something out of it that, uh, I'm going to use in my comedy shows, the Vale comedy show, Aspen comedy show, Parker comedy show. Uh, once they get back up and running right now, if you're watching this in the future, it's, uh, it's COVID-19 time. Everybody's on lockdown. I'm going on almost a month now in, uh, isolation and social distancing. I did a Zoom comedy show, not a Zoom, but a go-to meeting comedy show uh, a couple days ago. Uh, It was weird. It was definitely weird. Um, Anyways, this episode is chock full of great information. It's a little bit different. Usually I drive a comedian around. Brent Gill, very uh, busy guy. Uh, I caught up with him by telephone as he was driving from Denver to Boulder for a dentist appointment. And we had a great conversation. Uh, The technology, I don't know that I've got it all figured out yet. Um, Pretty proud that the Mark Masters podcast web series studio was able to uh, do a two-way recording of a phone conversation, but cell signals, etc. The the audio is, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, Focus on the content this episode. If you're watching the web series, there isn't live video of Brent and I. Um, you'll figure that out as you watch the episode. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, it doesn't really matter to you. Uh, just a reminder, I wrote a book called Not Good Yet. You can learn more about it at notgoodyet.com. Uh, I'm really bored during this whole coronavirus thing. Uh, send me a note, join my mailing list. I might send you a free autograph copy of the book because I've got a stack of them, uh, that I was supposed to tour around some libraries in April and, uh, doesn't look like that's happening. Um, so anyways, I hope everybody's safe and well, and I want to thank Brent Gill for making the time for this conversation. His Boulder Comedy Show, the in-person events every Sunday night are canceled for the time being, but you can catch them live every Sunday, 7 p.m. on Twitch. Go to bouldercomedyshow.com for more details, and, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. Tell a friend, sign up to my mailing list, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Uh, turn on notifications, and uh, bake something magnificent for somebody you love. Uh, And and be healthy, friends. Thanks a lot. Uh, Enjoy this episode. Here comes my conversation with Brent Gill. Okay, let's do it. Hey, I'm Mark Masters. Uh, We got Brent Gill on the line. We're going to talk about show running today. Brent Gill's a very... Why don't don't you tell us what you are, Brent? Okay. Uh, Well, I'm a... Comedian first and foremost, and uh, I just happen to be pretty good at producing comedy shows as well. Um, I uh, I run the Boulder Com. Well, I run three weekly comedy shows in two different states. Um, I run run my my biggest most prized possession would be the Boulder Comedy Show. Uh, that is at the Bohemian Beer Garden in Boulder on Sundays. Uh, we have two shows at seven and nine fifteen, and. Um, I've been doing that for coming on seven years now. And then uh, I also run a weekly show at the Kibitz Room at, at uh, Cantor's Deli in, uh, in West Hollywood and uh, on Monday. And then my uh, other one is in Pasadena, uh, South Pasadena Highland Park area uh, on Sundays as well at 7 o'clock. Um, and... Uh, so yeah, so, I, so I'm the idiot who was like, yeah, I can run two shows in two states, separated by a time zone. <laughs> That'll be smart. So, are, uh, are you at them yeah. all the time? Do you fly back and forth, or how does that work? No, so like I'll be, I'll be at, you know, 
like I'm always missing one of my shows on Sunday, either Boulder or Arroyo. Uh, you know, that's just unfortunately how how I've structured my my life right now. But um, the shows out there in California, I have more help. Uh, it's not just me uh, doing it. I have uh, both shows have their own producer who is not a comedian. They just want to book and produce and stuff like that. Um, and then the, uh, well, that's not true. Only one of them is not a comedian. The other one is a comic and a producer. Um, her name's uh, Nicole Blaine. The other one is Trish Hadley. Uh, and I am lost without them. They're, they're, they're fucking amazing. Um, you know, Trish does a lot with uh, Arroyo, she's also a television producer as well. She does stuff like Children's Hospital, uh, the new show Medical Police coming up, she did the, the reboot of Mystery Science Theater 3000, all that kind of stuff. And um, so she's very well connected, and, uh, and I really like having her on board. And then uh, I also run that Arroyo show with Chris Charpentier, who's another comedian friend of mine. And uh, so they're able to hold the fort down. While I like, I normally go back to Boulder about once a month to make sure things are okay, and you know, still rolling how I want them to roll because, you know, this is my business, and I've, you know, both technically like it's it's a it's an official business, it's an LLC, and it's you know it's it, it's a uh, it's a lot of my living as well uh, that I've just been able to cultivate over several years of uh, of not making any money and. <laughs> And then it finally kind of turned it into a thing. So that always takes my number one priority, uh, the Boulder Show does. And Kibbutz is nice because I run that with, you know, like I said, Nicole Blaine and Esther Steinberg. Esther's another comic. She originally started the show six years ago. It was on, she got it on, uh, like, its own TV show called Honey Girls. That was on Oxygen. And, uh, and then she moved to New York, handed it off, and eventually kind of got, got – got run into the ground and then um i moved to la in october of 2017 yep and uh so about two and a half about two years ago and uh uh i ran into esther outside of the comedy store and uh, i didn't know she had moved back and she didn't know i was there i was like yeah i'm trying to find a show to run like Boulder and stuff like that and so we eventually revived uh the Kibbutz room and uh you know that's the that's the best worst show in LA right there the Kibbutz room nice. it's uh yeah it it is awesome and it also sucks complete ass all the time it's, it's crazy so it's really fun but it's really annoying what what makes it annoying as compared to the Boulder comedy show maybe which sounds like you're more positive on um well, it's funny. For the longest time, I wanted to leave the show. Uh, I just have a hard time breaking up with things and people. <laughs> so I uh, I wanted to leave the show, and I wanted to, uh, you know, it just because it – all right, here's why. A uh, couple reasons. It's just I, I don't have the control like I'm used to having in terms of uh, support of the venue type of control where, where they're like, you know, you have our wholehearted support. This is your time slot all the time. Do whatever you want. We support you. Uh, at the beginning, it didn't. It didn't. It wasn't like that. It wasn't. It took me about a year before I was like, "Yeah, I love this show so much." And it took me having to let go and not care about the show for it to succeed. How I, for me to be happy there. Hmm. Uh, and I and, and I know that sounds so weird, and it's so weird to start this kind of conversation with that because i don't believe in that and it took me a long time to do that uh it was just the venue has i mean it's a staple in hollywood it's been there for fucking ever uh the kibbutz room is like where guns and roses started uh i mean it's just this historic classic place um that you know amongst the industry everyone knows the kibbutz room be it music or mostly music and then comedy next but um, so, uh, and it's also right in West Hollywood. It's on Fairfax. A lot of agents, managers come there. And, uh, so it, it's a good spot. But the problem was I came in there, 
you know, with a lot of really good ideas that they weren't willing to, like they were willing at first, but then they kept nixing them as it went through. So for example, the room got reorganized uh, before I took the show over and now it's a long room, right? As opposed to a wide room, like where the stage is in the middle of it and, and you're really playing right to left uh, versus what this show is, is the stage at the end of the room and you're having to, you know, throw your jokes all the and, and the bars at the very back. So we have tables and chairs and shit like that up front. Uh, but for a while, we, we had to fight with the regulars. Uh, and then so what my idea was, I was like, okay, cool. Here's a great idea. Why don't I take this little camcorder I have, we'll connect it to the video output, and we'll plug it into the TV. So now the people at the bar can see the show really good, and they're also hearing it because we have house speakers. Right. So it, so it put, it forces it puts it in front of their face. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I was I I proposed that for the Vale comedy show because it's a similar layout. I'm curious to hear how yeah. it went for you. Did it go okay? Oh, it was or? a fucking great idea. Every comedian was like, "This is the greatest idea ever." I can't believe more places don't do this. And one day, the fucking old ass TV they had it was a Pioneer Elite, and I sold TVs for Best Buy for several years. I know TVs. I know that TV especially. That was a legendary TV. Uh, and one day, uh, it wouldn't project the – and the camera I bought was garbage and small. So not a big deal there, but one day it wouldn't project the, the image of the camera. And I was like, all right, whatever, fuck it. I've run out of time. Uh, I'm going to you know, just keep the TV off. Well, the TV didn't turn back on, and they blamed me for that. Uh. And I'm like, I know TV. Trust me, I plugged in an input, and it didn't work, so I turned it off. I didn't do anything to break your TV. So then the fucking owner of, of, of Mark Cantor, who could give – I don't know if there's anything he could give, give less of a shit about than our comedy show, uh, especially back then, uh, was like, don't – you know, no one touches the TV. They wouldn't let me even turn it off. They just go, we're going to turn it on a boring, like something boring, you know, hmm. like, you know, that old sucks. classic. Movie. That's terrible like, for yeah. a comedy show. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, dude, I, trust me. I know this shit. I did not break your TV. And so they mixed that. Then I had posters that I paid for out of my pocket. I hung up and uh, within hours they were taken down because I came in early on Monday put them up, and by the time I got there for the show, they were all taken down, even the ones in the bathroom. And they weren't in the restaurant. They were just in the bar. And they're like, yeah, you, you can't put on whatchamacallit. Uh, and I'm like, well, then fucking tell me and don't just throw them away. I just paid for this shit. Right. Uh, and so then crowd sucks in terms of both numbers and quality. And it was, it was very squire-ish. You know, like that type of show or like uh, and it just sucks. Uh, and it wasn't until because every idea that I brought to them, of, this is my expertise. I know how to run shows and I know how to create a great experience. They just nixed and said, no, we can't do that. And here's why. And here's why. And here's why. Also, we can't charge because they don't have a cabaret license. So I can't legally charge money, which therefore people hear free and think shit. So it's just uh, it, it was a. It was quite a learning curve. It was very humbling going from what I've created in Boulder to that show. Uh, and it wasn't until I was just like, fuck it, I'm just going to use this for stage time. Uh, and then I then I kind of learned the room a little better. I got more comfortable in the room. And then it got more fun because, I mean, like I say, it's the best worst show ever because we're pulling people from the store. We have Jeff Ross popping in. We have Mo Mandel. We have Clayton English. We have, like, all these, like, hitters. And just pop in for sets. Jordan Ross will come in. Jack Knight, uh, Kyle Kinane, all these dudes will just roll in to do spots. Um, and the crowd just doesn't give a shit. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> like, it, you know, that's what I mean by it's the best worst show ever. Um, and, 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 and once I just quit trying, uh, oh, it's game time decision. Am I past it? I'm past it. We're not doing that. Um, sorry, that was a traffic thing. I had to 
you know, look into. Uh, no so problem. by letting go of that, of that, like, this is not going to be your boulder. You don't have the control you want, and you will not have the control you want. So just enjoy it for what it is, and enjoy the ride while you have it. And then it, I just really, because, again, because what you're going to find out running multiple shows, first of all, I have failed at way more shows than I have succeeded at. I have run countless shows into the ground, both ones I've started, ones I've taken over, uh, and it is hard. What, it is what, very hard. What would you say causes a show to die? Like, what's the last straw that – is it just the venue quits on you or no? You know, so, so I've been kind of like giving like this lesson plan to one of my – to a young comic who's helping me out in Boulder right now because I just need like an assistant basically up there. And so I'm, I'm really mindset on this. And what I can boil it down to, everything for a good comedy show is based on relationship. And this is the same for life. This is the same for any business. Uh, but it's, it's all relationship. It's the thesis of everything. Uh, and then growing from that, <clears throat> what I mean by relationships is your relationship with the venue, your relationship with your sponsors, your relationship with your comedians, your relationship with your uh, – Patron, all of that is super important, and I think what the final, the real thing that is the kiss of death is when the venue quits on you, or if they've never really hopped on your train. Now, I will say this: you can't expect the venue to be one thousand percent gung ho you without some res- some reservations or concerns at the beginning. Of course not. But again, relationship. How do relationships happen? Well, you fucking build. <clears throat> you build them over time. You build them from week after week, showing them, proving to them. You're always there. You're always on time. You're not the one that screws up. If there's an issue, it's the venue's fault. And you're cool about it. Not a big deal. We'll get this figured out. Right. That kind of stuff. is. And, and, once, and, and if a show is going and the venue did support it and it gets shifted over to another person who runs it or what have you, and all of a sudden the attendance starts to dip, the quality of the comedians start to dip, whatever it is, all that can be fixed. Up until the venue is like, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's pretty hard to overcome. That's pretty hard to overcome. Right. Um, so, you know, that's where, that's what I think the kiss of death is, is when the venue quits on you. Because everything else can be changed. You can get better comments. You can, you know, improve your experience for your customers. You can do all of that shit. So what do, what do you think – a lot of people say that the Boulder Comedy Show is one of the best shows around. Why do you think it's so great, and was it always great? Like what have you done to make it so good? So I think – so it's a, it was a perfect storm of a lot of things that really makes it at what it is. Uh, you know, I, I'm in a space at, at my Arroyo show where I'm like, Yo, know, this could be the next boulder, but I still don't think it'll ever be as beautifully perfect. It's a symphony up there, and it was just a perfect storm of these different ingredients that um, that came together. And those ingredients are the beer garden just moved into that space, so they were brand new. They had they had opened six weeks before we started our first show, so within a month they were looking for comedy. And they knew they wanted comedy. Okay? okay? So that was one thing. So they were new. So as they grew, we grew. And we grew together. So their clientele, because again, when you're opening a, a place and doing a show in a space, you got to get their clientele there first. Before you try to put erroneous butts in seats, get their clientele who already goes there on board with your show because if the regulars don't want it you're then you're going to be fighting with it right right. so i wanted the beer garden to like your put my posters up everywhere i want everyone to know put me on the menu on the calendar i want everyone to know that we do comedy here so the people that already love it here have yet another reason to come here and now of course bohemian beer garden is going to love here and that because they're like fuck yeah let's keep people coming back in these doors you know, so, yeah. so that so that helped. They were new. Uh, I was ready. I have I had already run shows into the ground and failed. 
it, and, and like I'm hard on myself. I did a good job. It just it wasn't really sustainable. You know, whatever. I was ready at this point. I was already on the roster at Comedy Works. Um, I had been doing it for you know six, seven years. Comedy in general for six or seven years. I know how to. I knew how to host at this point. I knew I had enough relationships with the with the roster comics at Comedy Works that I could get them up to my space uh, for um, for a reasonable amount of money. But basically what I did with them is I, because of my relationship with them, I was like, hey, here's the deal. I'll pay you what Comedy Works pays me. And the only gig that you're going to get from Comedy Works that's better than what I'm going to pay you is a headline spot, which you will have already booked. So you will know if you can't do my date. So I was like, let me guarantee you this money to do a spot, same amount of time, same amount of money at my show in Boulder. Uh, and then, so I brought quality comics up each time. I built the show off of, it doesn't matter who's here. It matters what's here. This show is great. You don't know who these people are, but when you leave, you're like, God, that was fucking great. That, that Brent Gill guy, man, he is great. I don't know who he is, but he was funny. That kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So then that came in. So it was the venue being new. I was ready. And then Boulder doesn't have a comedy show, but I had run two shows in Boulder. I know how difficult it is to mobilize people on Tuesday through Saturday. So I have between Sunday and Monday to choose from. I didn't want to take my Friday. Meet all the stuff, you know, and, and I work with all the big headliners. So I was like, all right, well, what day can I do that isn't Tuesday through Saturday? And that was Sunday or Monday, and I thought I could build something on Sunday that could last. Uh, because the last longest-running show in Boulder was an open mic that actually shared a wall with my current venue right now, which is hilarious, uh, called Redfish. And that was on Sunday nights at 930, and a lot of the Denver comics would come up and do that mic. A lot of the pros would. So I knew that I could get the comics up here. I knew that that would be a good night that could sustain comedians coming up and some audience. Um, and so it was just a perfect storm of all those things that I came in as the, you know, fucking low pressure front and just created a, a tsunami, uh, like this massive hurricane of like perfectness. Yeah. Um, and and it, then. It is incredible. I've, I've been several times as an audience member, and it is packed. The energy is out of control. The comedians are outstanding, like flown in from Los Angeles. It's incredible. Yep. It's really fun. It's really fun. And, 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 it, and again, that was luck. That, not luck, but with all those things, I then treated it like a comedy club. I'm not trying to run a show. Here. Well, I am, I am running a show, but I treated it like Wendy – treated the experience of her patients at comedy work wendy of course is wendy curtis the owner of comedy work she's also the talent booker she does everything she's queen queen bee at comedy work and she had um she had just so like welcoming them so that that experience when they walk in is very important the experience when they leave is very important the way that the, the staff interacts with them, the way that you interact with them, like, hey, thanks for coming, you know, uh, uh, how'd you hear about the show? Or, you know, just say, hey, thanks for coming. Good, you know, thanks right. for supporting what we're doing. That kind of stuff, uh, creating that nice environment for them uh, and that experience, uh, it just feels right. It feels like you're going to a proper show. Um, and, and I'll say this, a lot of what I learned about what to do at a show uh, really came from what not to do at a show. <laughs> because I've been to enough shit shows where I am like, okay, I know that I don't want these things. And if, because, because here's something super important. If you're, if you're listening to this and you're like, all right, I'm going to do print this and I'm going to replicate that. Well, you know, I, I'm flattered and that'd be dope. Uh, and you will probably have a decent show. But what's better to do is to look at what not to do, and then the sky is the limit. Because if you put a roof over this, all right, so I have to structure this show like Brent did, and you put yourself in this box, in this house. All right, so Brent did this, he charged this, he updated this, you know, you 
you, you try to do what I do, then you're only operating within these limits. Where if you look at your house of like, okay, well, here's the, 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 the limits of what not to do. Now I can experiment. I can fuck around. I can figure out something that Brent didn't even fucking know about. And then then you, then you your mind is open to get it to your show, your space, your venue, your environment, your situation. And, um, I, and that to me was the most beneficial was knowing what not to do. TV's off. Boy, I've done shows where they're on, and that sucks. No, nope, no TV's on. No TV's even in the room in my room. Um, the uh, uh, God, it's been so long since I've thought about these things. Um, but I think that that point makes sense. Is like going to a show and enough shows where like where you think as a producer, what do I not like about this? Right. And then and to make sure that you have that. Because I know you're not the only one who doesn't like it. Right. There are some basic so then, logistical things like seating, lighting, sound. Uh, can you talk a little bit about music? You'd be surprised how many fucking shows don't have those. Right. Like, I've done shows where I'm like, are there t- yeah. Is there a sound? Is there a stage? Are there lights? Kind of had a, kind of hard to have a show where people are standing, they can't see you, and they can barely hear you. It's a fucking awful experience. Right. And why would you want to come back to that? Why would you want to tell your friends about that? People share bad news and negative reviews way more than they share good reviews. That's why it took seven years to get this far. Right. Now, granted, I will say this. So it wasn't, no, it was, to answer your question from a while ago, no, it was not immediate. Um, but it was faster than any of my other shows, even the ones I'm, I'm currently producing. Um, it was... <clears throat> Because I and, and Facebook too reminds me of that because I have a uh, you know it does the time warp or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, so about about two years like I had one or two uh, sold out shows in the like probably eighteen months in I probably had one or two sold out and that's typically those were typically only on three day weekends. So on like Memorial Labor uh, you know any Monday off um, thing. Yeah. Uh, it. It's slam packed in there, both shows. Uh, I also didn't start the second show until we were turning away legitimately 50, 60 people uh, a night. And I was like, time to expand. Huh. And I went through and I thought about, uh, I thought about how, um, I thought about going to a different venue. I was hmm. like, should I go to a different venue? Should I, what should I do? stay out that late on a Sunday uh, I don't know and uh, and uh, hold on real quick let me sure. just do it here. Uh, I'll just say real quick while you're doing whatever you're doing uh, if you go to bouldercomedyshow.com anybody who's in Colorado uh, you can get more information I would strongly encourage you to go check out a show it's incredible it's a ton of fun yes and yeah. yeah thank you that links to the boulder uh comedy show facebook page uh eventually we'll, we'll have a website i just didn't really need one um at the moment so i just didn't fucking make one yet but i will eventually um anyway i'm back on track now okay cool. uh so it didn't it didn't it didn't it wasn't immediate for sure but it was definitely you know because the beer garden was also growing in popularity, I was growing in popularity with them. So, so I always say we grew together. Um, and then as far as like the, you know, second show, do I go to a different venue that's bigger? Do I do another night? I didn't want to drive up here twice in a week. I didn't want to because it's a lot. And I didn't want to go to a different venue either because I um, – I built this relationship with him. Right. He, he, right? And I, I was like, I don't want to fucking start over again. I don't even live in Boulder. I live in, Den- I, at the time, I was living in Denver. Like, when I started the show, I was living in Denver. Hmm. Um, I only went to school there, 04 to 08. And then I moved to Denver. And, uh, and yeah, I started comedy up there. But I moved down immediately to Denver because that's where comedy was. So it, it was, you know, I just went up there because I knew that there was kind of a need. Uh, and I wanted stage time. Um, but I'm glad I didn't switch venues because I went to, uh, two shows 
seven and nine fifteen. And I remember one of the so we started it on Valentine's Day and we fucking packed it out. Uh, and then um, and then I got a little greedy because uh, after that it was very light and I changed my door deal for the second show with them. So I have two different door deals for each show, even though it's the same night. Okay. Um, and I changed my door deal out because I was getting hit hard. Uh, off that second show because the way that it's kind of arranged or was arranged it was like a if there's this many paid customers then they get a flat fee of which uh, which I was hitting that number uh, like I was like two over and that flat fee was designed for to encourage me to bring more people uh, so it basically would be I would go home with 60 bucks your guard would go home with 150 on that second show and I'm like well this isn't going to work out so I changed the door deal because I was losing money. And ultimately, that was a bad idea because the show did grow like I knew it would. Uh, but I was kind of scared. You know what I mean? I was sure. you know, I was putting in all this work, and, and it, it wasn't showing pay off how it was supposed to quickly. And, uh, you know, long run, it's not that bad. You know, I'm, I may be down a, 100 bucks a week uh, off of the difference of that, of, that, of that door deal I changed. But it's not a huge deal. Yeah. Um, but I will say this, a couple weeks in, we had a second show where there were three people at the second show. There were two people sketching for a class, and the third had been to the first show. <laughs> and you better believe I did the show. Absolutely. Because if you cancel one, those people are not going to – they don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah. This is where Wit 10 went wrong. Wit 10 used to have fucking ni- a rule of 20 people or there's no show. So they'd have 19 people sitting in line, not drinking for 45 minutes, and then be like, oh, sorry, show's canceled. Well, what the fuck was that? Now those 19 people are never going to come to your show ever again because they don't know if it's going – because you ruined their night. They yeah. have a babysitter. They came out, and you canceled the show? Hmm. What was Wits End? So, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, Wits End. What 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 is so, what was that? Where was that? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that was like a, a B club, a C club, uh, up in Westminster. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, that was up there uh, for a while. Okay. Uh, but that shut down, you know, maybe seven years ago, six years ago. Uh, but but those three people in my audience, right, did a full on show for him. The beer garden wrote me a check, full price. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Consistency, so, consistency, you consistency. Can't, yeah. You can't fucking, you can't buy consistency and you can't buy a relationship like what I have with the beer garden. You have to build it. The fact that they wrote me a full check, it was like, no worries. We'll see you next week. It'll grow. Good Lord. You can't ask for anything better than that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. So, hey, so I, I have a couple yeah. of selfish questions. Myself, personally, I, I've run a couple. I got 10 minutes. Okay. I've run a couple showcases. And I just recently started a regular monthly show up in Vail, VailComedyShow.com. Uh, first question, uh, music. You have music at your show. What Do you think that's important? Do you play music between the acts? I can't remember. I know you have it in the beginning. Uh, can you talk about uh, that? I have bit? it at the beginning. Um, I'd love to have it, you know, in between. It's just not logis- It's just not worth the logistics of making that happen. Okay. Um they're, like my crowd's good enough that they'll clap the entire time. Uh, the comics are, for the most part, aware enough of the space of the room that they'll get themselves close to the stage, so I don't have, so they, the, the audience doesn't die. Right. Um, What's your so, opinion uh, on music between acts in other venues where it, where it is logistically? Possible? I like it. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I have th- no I... opinion for 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 or against it. If I had to, I'm probably sixty forty for it. 40% against it. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't care. I think it does nothing but help. Yeah, it, I think it keeps the energy. Crowd. It's nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I also, me personally, me personally, any show I produce or any show I headline, I want funk music or <clears throat> playing before okay. my show. Okay. Uh, puts I, people in a good I, mood. I puts people in a good mood. Funk music always make like you hear James Brown going on Funky Drummer and and you don't want to wiggle a little bit. It doesn't make you feel good. It doesn't make you nod your head a little bit. That's that's what it does. Right. And I think that it puts them in that in that good vibe, uh, you know, to get them to get them laughing. 
Let's oh, fuck it. God damn it. Fucking people in Boulder are the worst. They're the fucking worst. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, how about some hosting tips? Uh, just general for more a stand up comedy question. What do you think is important as a host, as a show host? Oh, I can't believe that person did that. Sorry. Um, ask me one more time. Yeah, sure. Hosting. Show hosting what's the yeah. question? Uh, just like uh, some tips on hosting. What do you think is important if you're hosting a show? What some mistakes um, or or positives? But that's a whole other podcast in and of itself. <laughs> Fair um, enough. <laughs> I would say this. Uh, um, well, I mean, you headlined well, Comedy Works last night, so right, it might not right. be top of mind. Had a host, right? That, well, no, it, no, it's fine. It, it, it's um, for me, it's a um, it's tough. It's not your show, right? But it is my show. So, it, like, there's two ways to kind of look at it. If you're hosting at a club. And, and this is not your home and this is not your deal that, you know, you're a representative of the club, get the announcements out, do, do your job, make them laugh, uh, you know, know their names, know how to pronounce their names, know what their credits are. Don't get their credits wrong. Don't be an asshole. These people worked hard for these credits. Get them correct. Um, and, uh, you know, also too, I heard, I heard a stat one time that seventy percent of seventy uh, percent of crowds at any given show that's their very first comedy show ever. Huh? Crazy, right? Yeah. And, and even if it's fifty percent, that's still fucking crazy. Yeah. So uh, they don't know who you are. They don't know if you're if you're just the the manager of the club. It's like, all right, everybody, settle down. We're gonna start the show. Here's your next stop. They don't know that. Uh, and you just go up there and start firing off jokes. Now this is all personal. This is just me, Brent Kill. This is how I believe the theory of hosting should be. Everyone has their own theory, so sure. you know this is just me. Okay. Uh, but they don't know who you are. They don't know what you do. They don't know what you represent. They don't know fucking anything about you. And they also probably think that the first comic's the worst, second is the second worst, third is the third worst, and the, and the last one's the best, right? Yeah. Um, so, so don't go up there and just blast into your jokes. You know, welcome them. Thank them for coming. Hey, I'm your first comedian. You are the first comedian. Yeah. You're the first one up. You're a comedian. Unless you're not a comedian and you are, in fact, just a show producer and you just want to not have a cold open. That's also great, too. Uh, on my other two shows, I will – the one who's not hosting will introduce the other. So yeah, I'll go up there nice. like, hey, thanks for coming. Uh, we got a great show for you tonight. Thanks to our bar staff for being here. Thanks to our sponsors. You know, we're going to get the show rolling with our host tonight. Very funny. Here's their credit. Give it up for blank. Huh, nice. You'll see me in a little bit. I'll be, be back up here, in, you know, in a little bit. Uh, but first, your, that kind of stuff. Um you know, it just breaks the ice for them. And then you can fire right in your jokes because they're, that they know what they have. These they know what to expect. Right. Huh. Um, also, uh, and this is straight out of Deacon Gray's mouth. God rest his soul. Uh, don't want up comics, right? I go up there. I close on a joke about dogs. Don't go up there like, oh, I got a joke about dogs. And go fucking try to one up me with your fucking dumb dog joke. I just close on. The, I chose this as my closer. And you're gonna try and riff on my dog on a dog joke that you have half thought out. Right. Just go fucking do, do something else. Do another joke if you really feel like it. I am not a big fan of a lot of banter in between. Yeah. I also don't like the the crowd is still clapping for the last comic, and then they're they're just like, "All right, our next comic is this person. Here we go." You know, and they're like, "What the fuck just happened?" Like, give them some time to reset. Also. If a comic goes up there and destroys, and there's still another comic next, or like the headliner is next, go clear the plate. Huh. Go up there, uh, you know, do an announcement if you have one, or do some material, or whatever it is. But go up there and clear the plate, uh, for the, and cool the energy down for the next comedian. Huh. Interesting. That's great advice. Um, 
you know, because that way, shit, dude, like, sometimes it's fun to ride the wave. I, you know, that's subjective, I guess. Some comics wouldn't want you. I, I don't know. That's hard to say. But for me, if, like, if Ben Roy goes up there and demolishes because he just wanted a local spot, uh, and and, yeah. and Ben Roy is one of our local He's darlings the best. here. I love him. Uh, he is the best. And if he goes up there and destroys, Which and I will. know that my headliner is a low energy comic, you know, one I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't put him back to back. First of all, okay. But if they are, if that's how it is, you know, go up there and clear the play. But I know some headliners that will ask to, for, for you to do a couple jokes, two, three, five minutes in between. Huh. Interesting. For sure. For sure. Okay, well, we got to land this plane. Uh, you got anything besides the Boulder Comedy Show you want to promote? Uh, yeah, I'm super active on my Instagram. Okay. Um, that's I am Brent Gill. And uh, I'm also super active with my YouTube channel as well. I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of building that up. And, uh, okay. come on. And, um, uh, and do you have a so that, and that's just Brent Gill comedy. Uh, how about this seventh anniversary uh, Boulder comedy oh, show? Yeah. I've heard a little bit about. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, May seventeenth is the uh, seven year anniversary of my Boulder comedy show. That's 2020. Uh, it's gonna, yep, it's gonna be the. Um, man, I'm losing my mind here. I'm sorry. This traffic is is just infuriating me. <laughs> Um, no one is moving right now, and I don't understand why. Uh, wow. Okay, let's try this one more time. I, I hope you edit this. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, okay. But seventh anniversary the, show, May 17th, 2020. Where is it? At the Boulder Theater. Whoa, the Boulder uh, Theater. How many seats at the Boulder Theater? 900 seats. Holy cow. And how many at the Bohemian Beer Garden, like when it's packed 100 out? 100 seats. Okay, nine times as big. Uh, the, I mean, the, like the most I've ever had is uh, 148. Okay. Um, in there, we typically average about 120, 130 on that first show, uh, about 80 or 90 on that second show, and then. That's incredible. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, and then we saw 10,000 people at the show. I was very proud of that. Wow! And, uh, really? Huh? Yeah, 10,000 people. That's amazing. So I have a pretty good feeling I can do the. Uh, I can do the uh, that 900 seats at the Boulder Theater. Hmm. So, are you going to announce like again, the acts, or are you going to do it just like you normally do, where it's just it's the Boulder Comedy Show? Um, I'll, I'll announce them, but it, it, it's not going to be a big deal. Okay. Um, it's going to be a uh, just like here's who's on the show, and here are their credits. But my whole promo plan is this is what it's always been guys you might not know who they are but you know they're going to be great because i'm bringing them yeah and uh and they've always been great for seven years uh and i wouldn't throw this party you know without the best of the best on here awesome. that i can afford yeah you know so yeah. well thank uh, you so, yeah, so I'm really pumped. yeah really pumped. thank you for your time today and all your expertise on show running and, and thank you for running the boulder comedy show like i really enjoy it as a local whenever i'm free on a sunday night i love to go up there and be surprised by who's performing so thanks a well, ton well thanks man thanks for saying that I, I appreciate you you know liking the show and taking an interest in what i'm doing and uh you know it's uh it's a it's a passion for sure it's definitely a pain in the ass a lot of the times too i have a yeah. lot of fires that i have to put out from a, you know 1500 miles away but uh it's you know moments like this where i can help other people you know be it you or or your listeners uh i mean it just that it makes me feel like i'm doing something good for this world you know nice. I, i'm putting good in you are so, you know <laughs> i hope to get good good out yeah all right well thanks a lot brent gill all right man we'll talk to you soon we did it we survived a uh a whole conversation with Brent Gill, unbelievable. Great guy, full of incredible information about running shows. My favorite tip in there, uh, the one that I'm gonna implement going forward, is uh, the idea of having another comedian introduce the host so the host doesn't have to cold open. I think that's really cool and clever and a, a great idea um, that I'm gonna try and implement myself. One more time, check out brentgillcomedy.com youtube.com forward slash Brent Gill, B-R-E-N-T-G-I-L-L. -L. Um, Brent's on Instagram as well. Uh, check out the show notes for that. And check out his comedy shows, the two in California 
and his Sunday night weekly show, bouldercomedyshow.com. Uh, we have an unbelievable episode next week. It's a surprise Comedy Works headliner. Uh, the next two weeks are like that, and then we're done with season one. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this content. Uh, like, rate, review, whatever all that stuff is, and be safe and well and healthy, and uh, we're going to make it through all this, this crazy times. Okay? Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, another episode next week. Bye-bye.